Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Engaging Students in Science Using the 2017 Solar Eclipse, which is sponsored by McGraw-Hill's Access Science. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide um, an opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, you can click the buttons labeled Chat and Q&A in the upper right corner of the screen to activate the panels. Please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our speaker. At the end of the presentation, he will take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you experience any technical issues, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRL Choice webinars during and after this event. So if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up uh, email with a link to the archived version. All right, and here to introduce our presenter today is Hilary Maybaum from McGraw-Hill. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hilary Maybaum. I'm a senior editor at McGraw-Hill Education, where I manage a website called Access Science, which you can visit at www.accessscience.com. On behalf of McGraw-Hill, I'd like to welcome you all to this exciting webinar on the August 2017 solar eclipse. Dr. Jay Pasikoff, whom you're about to hear from, is one of our most prolific authors on access science. In fact, he contributed our quintessential article on eclipses in addition to many other astronomical topics. He also serves as a distinguished consulting editor to access science in the subject field of astronomy. Dr. Pasikoff is director of Hopkins University and a field memorial professor of astronomy at Williams College in Massachusetts, where he specializes in studying the sun during solar eclipses. His research of the upcoming total solar eclipse is supported by the National Geographic Society and the National Science Foundation. Dr. Pasikoff is an author or co-author of 26 books and editions, including The Cosmos, Astronomy in the New Millennium, the Peterson Field Guide to Stars and Planets, and The Sun, which is forthcoming in June. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Jay Pasikoff. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to work with the McGraw-Hill people on the encyclopedia and the yearbooks, and now for the first time on Access Sciences webinar. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, so solar eclipse. Uh, and first, let me just show you a general view of what it is like during totality at an eclipse. The moon is the dark silhouette in the sky surrounded by the solar corona. So the everyday surface of the sun is covered, the so-called photosphere, which stands for the sphere the light comes from. And we see this faint outer layer that is so faint that even though it's up today, it's behind the blue sky and you don't see it. So now the moon has blocked sunlight from coming to hit the Earth's atmosphere, so the sky is not blue, and we're in the shadow there. You see my silhouette at the right. At, toward the left, you see one of my students who's operating a telescope there. You see Jupiter as a point right over that telescope. And then if you look near the horizon and all the way around, 360 degrees, uh, we're looking out of the shadow of the moon and, uh, and then there's just light that's bouncing in. And for the same reason that a sunset is reddish or a sunrise is reddish, we see reddish on the horizon. So here, again, we are on the Earth looking up past the moon. The moon is blocking the bright everyday, uh, everyday sun. In fact, uh, about 100 years ago, when the last time 
which was the last time a total eclipse is passed across the whole United States from coast to coast. An artist named Howard Russell Butler was brought by the U.S. Naval Observatory to uh, Goldendale, Washington to paint the eclipse. Uh, he could take notes in two minutes and then spend hours making an accurate oil painting, uh, whereas photography was too slow to really see all the details in the corona. So now we have some techniques in the computer of using dozens of individual photos to put them together to uh, get abuse of the corona as good as these three by, uh, by Howard Russell Butler. He got so excited by the 1918 one, he did another one in 1923 and another one in 1925 for those eclipses. And you see them in place there above the entrance doors for the old Hayden Planetarium in New York, uh, the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, and now they've since taken that building down, so those are not mounted uh, any uh, anymore. Um, but here is the path from Goldendale, Washington at upper left, you see, in June 8, 1918, went through Baker, uh, uh, Baker uh, Oregon, and, uh, and across to Florida. And, uh, and then in 1923, there was an eclipse you see largely over Mexico, but he got it from a little bit of California on the left. And if you look at the upper right, uh, he got an eclipse in Middletown, Connecticut in 1925. And that eclipse went down to New York City. And people were on every rooftop along the west side of Manhattan uh, to see where the edge of the shadow was. And it turned out to be around 96th Street on, on uh, New York City. Um, and then uh, a Butler uh, had a summer house in Maine. And he saw the 1932 eclipse there. And he painted an oil of that. But it wasn't part of the triptych uh, otherwise. Um, and here is the path of the eclipse that's going to come this August 21st. And you see that Baker, Oregon, was in both times. Uh, we, uh, in addition to these maps that show the path of totality when the moon is entirely covering the sun, um, we, uh, uh, we have the whole United States and uh, Canada and Mexico covered by what we call a partial eclipse, where the sun is only partly covered by the moon. And it turns out the sun is so very, very bright that it's a million times brighter than the solar corona. So the brightness outside goes down by a factor of a million when we have a total eclipse. If you're off to the side, uh, say at a 50% eclipse, you wouldn't even notice it. Um, it, uh, it. It gets half as bright all the time, um, clouds or whatever else. In fact, even at a 99% eclipse, the, uh, the remainder bit of the sun, the remaining 1% of the sun is still 10,000 times brighter uh, than what it would be in in the hundred percent eclipse in totality, so the sky would still be blue and you wouldn't even see the uh, the corona. So it's important for the maximum effect to be within uh, within that yellow band, and in fact to have really any substantial effect to be within that uh, to be within that yellow band. So we are trying to encourage all 300 million Americans to travel into that band where about 12 million Americans are, already live. And I know we're not going to succeed uh, in 300 million, and the, uh, and the uh, departments of transportation are pretty wary about the traffic on that day uh, also. But uh, if you're at all uh, able, you should uh, be in totality. It's a little bit like the difference between Clark Kent and Superman. Clark Kent was a perfectly nice guy, very ordinary, so that's a 99% eclipse or a 90% eclipse or an 80% eclipse. And Superman has the special powers, and that is only within that yellow band that you, uh, that you see there. Uh, so here's a, a close-up of this 1918 eclipse painting that Butler did. So you see the dark moon in the middle. You can see that there were some clouds around. So he was seeing it through clouds, so the sky doesn't have to be completely clear. It's mostly clear in the United States uh, on August 21st. On the whole, statistically clearer in the Northwest than in the Southeast. Anyway, uh, here Butler can see the corona. Also close to the edge of the sun, you see these reddish things sticking up. Those are called prominences. They are a gas that's a little hotter than the everyday sun. Uh, and we see mainly reddish light from hydrogen uh, that's, uh, we say, in emission. It's against nothing in the background, so it just sticks out there. 
uh, and then it's surrounded by this whitish corona. That's actually a million degree gas, and that's the main part of our studies and how the corona of the sun and of, of course, billions and trillions of other stars gets to be heated to a million degrees. Okay, so here, is, here are those uh, paths again. Uh, I'm going backwards, I guess. Uh, slides. Um, yes, yeah, so these are, these are the three slides in the middle. Uh, in the middle there, you can see Venus in the sky above the sun in that 1923 eclipse from, from California. And there, at the very edge of the sun, at about the 2 o'clock position, you can see it looks brighter. Now, really, if, this were, if you were outdoors, it would be uh, uh, thousands of times brighter and would really be dazzling. So you lose the effect, even in a beautiful painting like this, um, unless you're really in that band of totality. But in any case, the moon is not completely round. It's got mountains on the edge and valleys on the edge. And the last little bit of sunlight, of everyday sunlight, that shines through a valley on the edge of the moon is so bright it looks like the diamond ring uh, effect. And that's what you see at 2 o'clock in this photo, in this, uh, well, this photo of that oil painting. And then in 1925, he did another one. You can see the, uh, uh, that the corona is not round. You can see there are streamers that go out to the side. In fact, you can see the equator runs from lower left to upper right. And on the poles, which is uh, sort of the 11 o'clock position and the 5 o'clock position, you see little plumes uh, coming up. So the sun is a giant bar magnet. You can visualize lines of force the way you would around the bar magnet that uh, goes up and around. And then on the surface of the sun, uh, we have sunspots, which are regions of the magnetic field that are thousands of times stronger than the normal uh, magnetic field. Anyway, here I am in front of one of those uh, paintings uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, and then uh, Butler went to see the 1932 eclipse, and you can see that uh, how extended it is to the side uh, and not much at the poles. And this is what happens when it's the minimum of the sunspot cycle. There's an 11-year cycle with the numbers of sunspots. And we are coming to that minimum now, so the corona will uh, probably look something like, uh, like this, uh, this uh, coming August. And one of the things that I work on is I work with some people who make theoretical predictions of what the corona will look like based on the sunspots and other magnetic field things on the surface of the sun. And then we compare it with what we actually observe, and we try to use that to improve all the mathematical modeling. Uh, you may know that we'd like to have fusion on Earth to take over from fission, to take over uh, from, from even other things like uh, solar energy. Uh, if we could make the fusion work, uh, then we'd have a lot of energy. There are some big projects trying to do that, and they're holding million-degree gas in place with a magnetic field. And the sun does that very well. Uh, but it, there are no walls uh, around the sun that distort the magnetic field. So we want to learn from studying the sun and the sun's uh, corona uh, just what the equations are that govern the magnetic field. And maybe we'll be able to apply them better uh, on Earth. This is a spectrum. The rainbow you can see at top goes from blue on the right to red on the left. Um, and uh, little bits of it are magnified in the second and third rows. And at the bottom right, you can see three little yellow lines, two little bitty ones and a brighter one. And uh, the two little ones are what we call the sodium lines. Sometimes we call them the sodium D lines uh, because the uh, German optician uh, Joseph Fraunhofer uh, managed to measure them uh, in the spectrum of the sun in 1814, uh, just over 200 years ago. Anyway, uh, when the French astronomer Jules Janssen took a, a new, the new guy's uh, spectrograph that he could take to an eclipse, he actually went to India in, uh, in 1858. He was uh, looking at uh, the spectrum, and of course at that time he was just looking with his eye, and he could see that there was bright yellow, and in fact that Bright yellow was so bright they could see it without the eclipse the next day, and they could pin down that it was not exactly the same place as those other two uh, sodium lines that they expected. Uh, and they didn't know what it was. And then, and then another astronomer, um, uh, the uh, Norman Lockyer in England, got his spectroscope 
And uh, finally, in working with a chemist, they still didn't know what it was. They knew it was something they didn't know what it was, so they called it helium uh, after the sun god because it existed only in the sun as far as they knew. Uh, and then it took another couple of decades before chemists on Earth actually isolated helium. And of course, now uh, we uh, use that gas for a lot of critical uh, lifting things for superconductor, we're making superconductors or helium. There's a critical supply of, uh, of, uh, of helium. It, it doesn't burn. So something like the Hindenburg explosion wouldn't have happened had it been filled with helium instead of hydrogen. Anyway, this was the discovery of helium. And then if you look to the left of that, you can see very faintly a circle or almost a circle of reddish, not the bright red, which is the hydrogen, but a little bit to the, red, to the right of that. And that comes from iron gas that is heated up to close to a million degrees. And at the middle top, you can see a, a sort of a circle of, in the green, and that is iron gas that's heated to about a million and a half degrees. And when that was figured out why these two lines uh, came from, they weren't just coronium, which is what people tried to call them, uh, starting from their, their discovery in 1869 and 1870, um, the coronium turned out not to be an element the way helium was, but it turns out to be iron that is very, very hot. So the corona has this very, very hot gas. So to study these things, we go uh, all around the world to wherever there's an eclipse. There's a total eclipse of the sun about every year and a half when the moon entirely covers the ordinary sun. And the moon's orbit is elliptical. So sometimes it's a little further from than average from Earth and sometimes a little closer. When it's a little further, it doesn't quite cover the sun and an annulus or a ring of everyday sunlight is left. That's called an annular eclipse. So if you look on this map, you'll see on November 14, 2012, we went to a total eclipse in Queensland, Australia. Uh, and then we went back uh, a few months later on May 10th, 1913 to an annular eclipse. Uh, you can uh, barely see it's a little more orange in the, uh, in the artwork there um, in, uh, for an annular, uh, for an annular eclipse. Um, and then um, the next year in 2013, you can see the path of the total eclipse. The uh, yellow line you can see is pretty narrow. So this was barely a total eclipse there. And in fact, the very little bit at the, at the left for a short time was actually annular. So the distance, so the earth kind of poked up a little closer to the moon just because of the round earth uh, to, uh, to make it the total eclipse. And you see the greatest eclipse was in the ocean. And I like to make my observations from solid earth so we can have tripods and base our cameras and, and telescopes on solid land. So we went to the west coast of Africa, just inside the, where that yellow line hit Africa uh, in Gabon uh, and observed the eclipse. We couldn't go exactly where we wanted to in Gabon alongside the national park because they said we could be trampled by elephants. So in fact, we didn't go exactly there. We went about 10 kilometers further south and, uh, and we went to uh, a, a village there that you see there. And there's a movie running now in real time uh, showing our observations. So the eclipse is just happening now. And you can see magnified upper left diamond ring. And you can see this reddishness, what's called the chromosphere, chromos for color. Uh, there, and you're going to see a one-minute eclipse, and you're going to see it in real time. So you realize when you look at a movie like this that one minute is a fairly long time. If you're taking pictures, you're moving around, uh, there's plenty of time to, uh, uh, to move around, uh, to take some images. Uh, this actually looks like it's a little slower than real, uh, than real time in this playback. Uh, but anyway, uh, there I am on the right. You can see me with orange pants, just covered over by somebody uh, there. Um, and you can see the shot in the middle, you can see the shadow of the moon darkening the upper part of the sky, and you can see the corona. You can barely see that there's a, the middle of that is blacked out by a silhouette. It's so overexposed that it is blacked out, which is why we have that close-up at the right. And now you see the chromosphere is appearing on the other side, and now the diamond ring, and so that totality is over. And it was all very interesting. and. Uh, and very exciting, and we came away with many images and spectra and, and things to study for, uh, for years.
In fact, here's a, just a comparison of a few minutes before on the left with my camera set up looking at the sky and you can't really see anything. The sky is blue. You just see the sun is overexposed and don't see any detail. And then during the eclipse, I had walked over to the uh, camera. <clears throat> so there's my silhouette against the sky. You see the reddishness on the horizon, but up above, you see the, uh, the uh, dark silhouette of the moon surrounded by the sun's corona. Here's the spectrum we got on that occasion. And at the bottom there, you can see uh, a strong uh, red circle. At the left, it's squashed a little bit. And that's the hydrogen light. And the reddish from the corona right next to it is very, very, very faint. But the green further to the right is brighter. You see the bright circle, it's called iron 14. That means iron has lost 13 of its normal 26 electrons. And it has to be a million and a half degrees to do that. So in 2013, we were no longer in solar minimum, uh, and therefore the corona was a little hotter, uh, so the green line was stronger than the red line. Um, and we are using that kind of measurements to see how the corona changes in temperature and how that relates to the magnetism that we also see in the, uh, in the sunspots. Um, there are some devices that can make what we call a coronagraph image. In, what, in other words, we cut out the sun to see some of the corona, and they only work from space or on a few very high mountains on, uh, on Earth that have clear uh, weather. Uh, but even from space here, and this is on a spaceship called the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, the Naval Research Laboratory has made uh, these coronagraphs. This one, uh, there, are three, there were three that were launched with the different, what we call occulting disks, here you see that black, that big black circle is cutting out not only the sun, but also uh, everything within about what we call one and a half solar radii around it. And they they can't look that close to this closer to the sun than that because there would be so much light scattering around that you couldn't see anything. Uh, and so here we pasted in the middle one of our images from the corona from an eclipse. And then instead of the black moon, we've even pasted a spacecraft image to show the center of the sun. And we can see where the eruptions come from uh, and trace it through our work at an eclipse and then out into the outer corona from space. At the bottom, you see uh, the, the space actually looked at this big eruption, huge eruption going down. You can see a bow shock at the very bottom. And we even have observations of that from the eclipse with the higher resolution. Uh, so here we pasted on our image at the, uh, at the bottom. You can see the circle, the white circle is just showing you the real size of the sun and how much more than the sun, the everyday sun has to be hidden. But here's a detailed set of observations that we made from an eclipse at the very bottom, including BA for bright arch, a feature that we're uh, studying there. And we published these results in various scientific journals, especially the Astrophysical Journal and a journal called Solar Physics. And so here's this eruption coming out from space, and there was another eruption that went out to the top. So uh, we, we can get glimpses uh, during the eclipse of the details that are connected to these eruptions that can be seen from the spacecraft. Sometimes the center of the shadow of the moon doesn't hit the Earth at all, and we only get the edge of the shadow. We get what's called a partial solar eclipse. Now, during the total eclipse, it gets so dark, a million times darker, that that you look at that straight with your eyes, it's about the same brightness as the full moon and equally safe to look at. But during a partial eclipse like this one, or the partial phases before and after the total eclipse, um, then you have to look through special filters to look at the sun. And these filters pass through only about one part in a million. So it's much, much denser than sunglasses. Sunglasses don't cut down the light at all enough. You'd have to have more than 20 pair of sunglasses in a row to cut the light down uh, enough, and even then it wouldn't cut out all the infrared. But here we had these beautiful views over a couple of hours uh, through filters uh, from the uh, Sacramento Peak Observatory and Sunspots in Mexico, but this was visible over a lot of the United States. And you can see on the surface of the sun then, there were these big sunspots. Um, so we're not gonna have those now, we're close to solar minimum, but it was fun to see the sunspots then. 
So this is a graph of what we call the sunspot cycle. You can see the dates along the bottom, 1960, 1970, et cetera, and the right, 2010. And you can see that around 29, 2009, uh, 2010, there was a minimum of the sunspot number. This is some measurement of the number of sunspots and how they group. And you can see that after that, the number went up, but it didn't go up as high as it was around 2000. 2000. So we're having, uh, we had a weak peak of the sunspot cycle, and now we're having a broad a maximum. And at the top right, uh, we can see when spacecraft were launched that are studying the sun. But there are eclipses scattered throughout this period. The uh, following eclipse, to the one I had mentioned, was up in the Arctic in 2015. And we went up to Svalbard, which is an archipelago controlled by Norway, at 78 and a half degrees, uh, most of the way to the North Pole from here. Um, and uh, you can see how elongated the shadow was at that time, just because it's around the curvature of the top of the, uh, of the Earth. And there were no elephants there, of course, but there were polar bears. And we had to be careful not to go too far from, from town unless we had somebody with a rifle with us because of the polar bears. And in fact, one tourist uh, went 60 miles out of town and was in a tent uh, in, inadequately uh, secured and was in fact mauled by a polar bear. And this was on worldwide news. I got a lot of emails wondering if we were safe. But we were close to the town and following the rules. And the only teddy bear, the only polar bears I saw were, were in, uh, in museums, or this one at the airport. Uh, but we did put together uh, a lot of, uh, of images. Uh, we worked with a New York musician and electronics expert, Wendy Carlos, uh, and, uh, and she took a lot of, of the individual images that we took up in Svalbard and put together this view of the corona. And you can see that there are streamers going on in all directions, so this is, means you're close to solar maximum. Um, and uh, there's some plumes visible at the lower left, but we'll be able to study the plumes especially well this year because of solar minimum. In this particular image, you can see the um, a reddish a prominence at the uh, about the 11 o'clock uh, position uh, sticking uh, sticking out, and and here is uh, an image, a, a little movie, speed it up 10 times, and you can see the shadow move across there, and you can see even that the sun was below the height of those mountains on the right, so we had to move off out of town a couple of kilometers, but just barely. Uh, close enough to town that we didn't have to have, uh, uh, have the rifle uh, with us. Let me play that movie again. So here you can see the sun moving along and the shadow sweeping by, speeded up by a factor of 10, and you can really see the shadow of the uh, moon fall on the Earth there. And it was cold, if in case anybody uh, uh, asks. Uh, it, it went from about uh, eight degrees above zero to minus seven uh, Fahrenheit uh, as the eclipse kept the sunlight from hitting and warming the Earth. And so here's a composite image of the corona at that time, um, made with, uh, with images made especially by my student, Allison Carter, and, uh, and a, a former student who's now a distinguished solar scientist who was in charge of the spacecraft that took the image pasted on in the center. So again, only on the days of eclipses do we get a complete view of the sun from its surface out uh, through the chromosphere and through the corona and out into space. And our Earth, uh, we are really enveloped in the corona. And sometimes these uh, eruptions can hit the Earth and, and hit satellites. Uh, they can even kill multi-hundred million dollar satellites if we don't protect them by perhaps turning down the high voltage if we get noticed. So this is part of what's called space weather. Uh, and studying the eclipses is part of studying space weather. Uh, here's an image taken in Svalbard uh, with my colleague Ron Dantowitz, and you can see these reddish eruptions, the prominences on the edge of the sun, and you can see the diamond ring effect, and above it, an extra little bead. Those are called Bailey's beads, a series of, of little bits of, of light coming through the, the valleys on the edge of the moon, and the last one is so bright in contrast that it's called uh, the diamond ring. Uh, so here's the view uh, with the shadow. Coming down, you can see the corona uh, surrounding the moon just to the left of those mountains there. You can see us up freezing on the uh, left side, really out on the ice for hours to see that eclipse. And here's the temperature. You can see that it went up uh, 
uh, after dawn, it went all the way up to eight degrees Fahrenheit. And then as the uh, moon started to cover the sun, it went all the way down to minus seven uh, and then eventually recovered um, and on the right side and went on with the rest of the day. So one of the things that people study is uh, the effect of shutting off the sunlight on the Earth's weather uh, and on things in the Earth's atmosphere. So the atmospheric science is like that. This little movie I'm showing you now is a cell phone movie uh, that, uh, that uh, C.J. McIntyre, a woman we met there, uh, took just, just with her normal cell phone. And you can see the effect on the horizon. You can see the, uh, the eclipse itself. So it's kind of fun to, uh, to make movies like that. And I'm part of a couple of uh, projects, one called the Mega Movie, uh, to uh, get people's cell phone movies or, and also a second movie with more elaborate uh, regular uh, single and reflex cameras um, across the country. And then there's another uh, citizen science event called Citizen Kate for Continental American, et cetera. Uh, and they're going to put, they have 60 plus identical telescopes spaced across the United States that they'll use to make a high resolution uh, movie. So there will be a lot of images uh, taken. I am working with NOVA on PBS to make a show that uh, they intend to air that night using uh, a few minutes of last minute coverage of the eclipse from that day, but we're preparing a lot of it uh, in advance, of course, to be ready that night. Anyway, after those eclipses, uh, last, uh, last spring on the right, you see total solar eclipse March 9th, 2016. That went across Indonesia into the Pacific. Um, and then you can see in the middle of these two ASCs, annular solar eclipse. Uh, first, September 1st, 2016, went, went across Africa into the Indian Ocean. And then the one on ASC 2017 went across uh, Chile and Argentina uh, into Africa. Uh, and then at the upper left is the one that's going to come to the United States uh, there. So in any case, I've certainly gone to see all of these. And the circumstance uh, here in Indonesia is we're looking, we're, we're sort of in the sun, with the sun's in the back, and you see the sun's illuminating the moon, and the moon is casting a shadow. And the darkest part of the shadow uh, is moving across uh, Indonesia there. There's Sumatra, there's Borneo. Uh, and we went to write about there in a little island called Ternate, one of the spice islands from hundreds of years ago. We got to see some nutmeg and mace uh, on, on the tree uh, and, into the, uh, and into the Pacific. And then this lighter shading is the partial uh, eclipse where part of the sun is visible. And so during that umbra, the dark uh, dot, you look at the uh, totality directly when for those few minutes of totality, but during the partial phases, when part of the everyday sun is visible, uh, you, uh, you, need the, uh, you need the special filters, which are uh, fairly generally and fairly cheaply uh, available uh, these days. Um, and, and here is uh, another view of the eclipse crossing. You see the partial phases begin for the people uh, in, uh, in these regions there. We're zooming into Java, you see the uh, the uh, main part of the eclipse is going to cross Sumatra there, and then Borneo and Sulawesi, and then we were observing right about there in an island called uh, uh, called Ternate, uh, as it went out to the Pacific Ocean, where it hit only ocean plus this one little atoll called Wilaya. And uh, and where we were, there were clouds in the sky, but. Um, we uh, we could um, see the all the eclipse phenomena, and uh, we were looking through clouds, but we could see everything. And on the top, uh, you can see uh, the partial phases that we viewed through filters, and then you take the filter away to see the uh, or to see the total uh, the total eclipse there. And here the temperature didn't was very different. It was 80, 84 degrees, not eight degrees. Uh, so in daylight, the uh, day warmed up, and then it leveled off as the moon began to cover the sun, and then it began fading during totality. Uh, and I couldn't see um, uh, anything for this dot here, so I just put a red dot to mark it. And then I looked at the notes that my colleague who had taken those measurements 
uh, made, and, uh, and she had written, too dark to read the thermometer. So it just gets very dark during that total a minute or two. In September, we went out to the Indian Ocean to see the uh, partial eclipse, and here's just a, a series of the moon covering the sun, but you see it's too small to cover the sun entirely. It leaves this annulus, this ring of sunlight, but it was fun to see uh, anyway. And, uh, and, here's, uh, and, then, uh, and then here is a set of, of uh, annular eclipse uh, images that uh, I, I see it's actually mislabeled on top. This was February 26, uh, 2017 for, uh, for this annular eclipse. You can see the series uh, of the moon covering the sun more and more and more, and then the ring of sunlight, the narrow ring of sunlight uh, at the right side of this, uh, this frame. And uh, so here's a series of those images from February 26, uh, 20, uh, 2017. Uh, and if you just look under a tree or, or make a pinhole camera, which is just punching a hole in a piece of paper and looking away from the sun, letting the sun project through the paper, here you just see on my, on my pants, you just see crescents. So the, the moon, the images are usually round because the sun is round on a normal day, but, uh, but during an eclipse, uh, they would be uh, crescent shaped, and you'll see that. So, the, and the, so the most recent ones were taken during this uh, annular uh, eclipse that you see across uh, southern uh, South America on, uh, on February 26. Here I am in the field with some of the cameras that took those images, and uh, here are some people just near me looking up. The woman on the right has a card with filter material in it. The man in the middle has these these same material put into glasses. Uh, the uh, person on the left has a card mounted in some bigger card just to keep more, more of the sunlight off her face. Uh, so there'll be a lot of those glasses around. Uh, and here's a series of, uh, of images of this uh, partial phase of the, uh, of the eclipse. Uh, and here's that, that same image uh, again. And then spacecraft, you can actually see the shadow going across. Uh, so NASA has a satellite up called, uh, called Discover. I'll play that one more time. Um, and you can just see the, the shadow of the moon. There's just three images. So it really makes that dark shadow on the surface of the, uh, of the Earth. And so we come to what we're going to have now in a few months, August 21st, 2017. Uh, you can see the partial. Uh, phases uh, cover quite a range, all of, of uh, Canada, past Hawaii and Alaska, into Siberia, uh, down uh, to the right, uh, to northern South America on the upper right, part of Africa, part of Europe. But the key part is to be in that yellow band uh, where the eclipse will be total. And we hope for, uh, for clear weather. Here's the path across the United States. It's a little longer in in Kentucky and Illinois, two minutes and 40 seconds. We're up where I'll be in Oregon, where there be just two minutes. But overall, the statistics of cloudiness for the morning of August 21st in Oregon is better than statistics for uh, the Southwest in the afternoon. Uh, so I'm taking my team to, uh, to Oregon. Uh, and uh, so overall, those statistics are more favorable in Oregon and Idaho and Wyoming, but uh, statistics are not the actual weather, of course, and only after the eclipse will we really know who's, who will see what. The event will really become very widely known, uh, especially in the newspapers days in advance. The, it's going to be such a big event that the Coastal Service has even put out a stamp, which is going to be released on June 20th. It was uh, using two images made by my colleague Fred Espinak and it's a very interesting kind of stamp where if you heat up that, so that well, the disk of the moon, really, the dark silhouette on the left, the total solar eclipse, the, uh, his picture of the moon is behind it, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to show as long as you have heated up the, uh, the uh, corona, the, uh, the dark moon silhouette from the eclipse, and then it will fade back to, uh, to seeing the eclipse. So that'll be fun on, uh, uh, on June 20th. And here's cloudiness statistics, which you see uh, at lower left is more favorable, though still not perfect. And upper right, say in South Carolina in the afternoon, it's, uh, it's really cloudy most of, the, uh, most of the time. So though the path 
looks the same all the way across, when you take the cloudiness statistics into effect, I'm going to try to the bottom left on this uh, on this graph, but um, and go in the in the blue region, which is more favorable uh, on the whole statistically than the than the dark orange re, uh, region. But it's worth a try anywhere, and if you're within even hundreds of miles of the eclipse, you really should try to drive into the path of the eclipse. And uh, lodging is largely taken in the in the in the places in totality already, but there are ways of getting into the path of the eclipse. You can see that we're now really down in the minimum of the sunspot cycle. It's going to go down a little more, uh, but there are very few sunspots on the sun, so we'll have the shape of the corona of the minimum of the uh, sunspot cycle. Here's a little more detail in the sunspot cycle, uh, and the yellow up and down is daily. So sometimes there are no sunspots on the, uh, uh, on the sun. Sometimes there are a bunch, but never as many as there are at solar maximum. And so we have many days with no sunspots at all, and the odds are that's what we'll have on August 11th, and that will give us streamers out to, along the equator, and we'll be able to see the polar plumes at the North Pole and the South Pole. And then any day, you can sign on to solarmonitor.org. This is a page there that shows, I show you a day that did have a sunspot. So there was a little magnetism in the upper left in that grayish image, and then in the yellow, the sunspot image, tiny sunspot you can barely see, and the reddish uh, hydrogen light image. You see it was pretty uniform except for this little active region where the magnetism is, and then the images in the bottom are hotter gas, million degree gas, and again, you can see that they're concentrated over the, uh, over the uh, sunspot regions. And so what's going to happen then is the moon will will uh, be, have its shadow cast in sunlight onto the Earth. So we're looking now past the Earth, past the moon, towards the sun. And here the shadow will cross the, uh, uh, the Earth on, um, uh, in this uh, tapering shadow with the darkest part on August 21st this year. And this is what it will be like uh, in the United States. First, we'll get a partial eclipse darker, 20, 40, 60, 80% covered, and then the umbra, this dark part, will, will cross Salem, where I'll be, Salem, Oregon, Boise, Idaho, Casper, Wyoming, uh, a little south of Omaha, Nebraska, barely Kansas City on one edge, barely St. Louis on another edge, go through Nashville, Tennessee, north of Athens, Georgia, and wind up uh, going out to sea past Charleston, South Carolina. So you really want to be in that red band that is shown in this uh, uh, in this uh, simulation. Uh, you will want to have these glasses for the partial uh, phases, uh, and uh, things change uh, fairly slowly during the partial eclipse, except for the last minute or two if you're near 100%. Um, but you have these glasses. I just use it to take a look every five or ten minutes. Uh, and Or you can just get the material in a card and hold up. And the advantage of that is you're not tempted just to stare up all the time because things change, uh, change very slowly. Uh, but uh, we do have those. You can buy a whole sheet of, uh, of that material um, and uh, put it in a frame and, uh, and have a, a class look. And, and here we see, in, uh, for example, uh, a class of four-year-olds. Uh, and you can see the uh, crescent images uh, cast, in this case, with a cheese grater, so there are many, many images, and it's just inspirational for children of all ages to see the eclipse. So we want to get the uh, preschool kids out. Uh, I just gave some lectures to elementary schools. We certainly are working in the high schools um, and the colleges, but the general public is just enthralled by being out during an eclipse, but you really want to be in, uh, in totality, so we're busy preparing everybody uh, for the excitement of the eclipse. Uh, these uh, teddy bears will be uh, available with their cute uh, glasses. Uh, and my friend has the website at greatamericaneclipse.com who makes these excellent maps, some of which you've, uh, you've just seen. And he's made this map here showing the path of totality going across the United States. We passed Salem, there's Jackson, Wyoming, um, into Nebraska, Alliance, Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, just the Kansas City is just on the edge. The northern part of the city is in totality. The southern part of St. Louis 
is in totality across Tennessee, gets a little bit of the corner of North Carolina and goes to South Carolina, uh, past Charleston and, uh, and out to, uh, to sea. Uh, and then there's going to be another total eclipse that will cross the United States on April 8, 2024, going up from Texas through Maine. Uh, so I hope you'll all get to see the 2017 eclipse, and you'll be so excited that you'll travel to see the 2024 uh, eclipse and enjoy it uh, and enjoy it again. Some of my students made some eclipse cupcakes, uh, so you can have fun with eclipse things just by yourself or with, uh, or with uh, your friends or with students. There are partial eclipses and uh, a partial eclipse cupcakes, and uh, you see some prominences with the red icing there, uh, and uh, you can see the reddish hydrogen light cupcake, and you can see a few sunspots, solar minimum, or many sunspots, solar maximum, um, or, or use candy corn for more of those prominences around at the edge of the sun, uh, or these ejections, uh, they're called coronal mass ejections. So my students call this one the coronal messy ejection for their icing. And, uh, and then uh, an annular eclipse made with icing uh, there. there and there'll be an annular eclipse uh, crossing the United States in 2023 before the 2024 uh, total eclipse. So it'll be partial phases of the country then. And then we recently saw two transits of Venus in 2004 and 2012, where Venus is, is uh, well, each of the chocolate chips is Venus at some time in about a six-hour passage of Venus over the surface of the sun. So my students had a good time making those partial eclipse and transit of Venus uh, cupcakes. Uh, so here again is the color-coded weather map of the uh, United States with the path of totality shown. I hope you enjoyed listening to me talking about the glories of totality, and I hope you all get to see the eclipse. Uh, this, in fact, is the cloudiness picture from last year on August 21st. And you can see there was a band of clouds in uh, West Virginia, and the Tennessee, North Carolina, but the rest of the path was really uh, clear uh, across, across the country. So this is one year before the, uh, the regular, uh, regular eclipse. So um, access science people, what do we do now about getting uh, events? For and, and uh, sign-ins from people online. Okay, I think um, Mark, you want to let us know if there's any questions or. Sure, absolutely. I see. I see. Okay, I'm I'm looking at the Q and A now. Uh, All right, and we've got. Uh, good uh, sign on, here. but I hope you got there. Good sound here. I can hear you. <laughs> These are just the tests, so I don't see any actual questions. Sure. So we'll give folks a moment. Um, if if you do have any questions about the eclipse or about um, any of the past eclipses that he has been to for um, Dr. Pasikoff, we'll give you just a moment to put those in. Um, and I think it looks like we've got... Well, so first of all, Virginia Pierce, I'm only seeing I'm going to make a live guide, a library guide, I guess. Um, so, and, and I'll answer both her and Belinda Blue, is that I have a website at eclipses.info. So that's just a very easy URL to uh, website address to remember, eclipses.info. Um, and uh, you can link to some of the maps there, for example. So the question, if the question is Beaufort, South Carolina, I'm not exactly sure where that is uh, in South Carolina, uh, but if you, uh, if you go to um, uh, to that the website and link, especially on the, the very second one, the second link on the whole page links to a Google map that you can zoom in on and, and uh, you can see whether you're inside or outside of totality. You can click on your location and see what time and how long things will take. Uh, and Virginia Pierce asked about great links to include about the solar eclipse. So there again, uh, there are uh, um, a number of sites, so we try to link them. I've tried to link them to eclipses.info, but you can also go to uh, eclipse.aas.org. That's the American Astronomical Society, uh, eclipse.aas.org. And then NASA has a site at eclipse2017.nasa.gov. 
uh, and there are a lot of there are a lot of other uh, good sites uh, too. What do I use to take photographs? Uh, well, a whole variety of, uh, of things. So first, let me say that if you're a first timer, what we really recommend is just enjoy the eclipse and don't distract yourself by taking photographs all the all the time. We'll have photo, plenty of photographs that uh, that you can uh, get access uh, to. But uh, what I uh, use to take the series of photographs is uh, telephoto lenses of at least 300 millimeters, uh, um, and I use a 500 millimeter on a full frame camera. Now many people have what are called DX cameras, at least with Nikon. So I use, I have some 300 and 400 and 500 millimeter lenses and uh, Nikon digital cameras. Uh, and then uh, very important is a sturdy tripod because um, you don't want anything to shake. Uh, and uh, I use an electronic cable release so I can take the snap the shutter without actually touching the camera. You plug it in and, and you're holding something on the end of a wire so you don't shake the camera. So steadiness is really very important. And then I vary the exposure. Uh, the Corona has such a big brightness range that I take short exposures, I take long exposures, I just take the whole sequence, and each one shows something good. Uh, Nikki O'Leary, do museums, et cetera, in the past of the eclipse sponsor eclipse watching parties? Yes, there'll be a lot of those. Uh, all the science museums, many other museums, amateur astronomers all over the country will, uh, will have eclipse watching parties. So there will be uh, uh, a lot of uh, clip classes have been distributed to libraries. Uh, so there'll be a lot of activity there. And on the AAS, the eclipse.aas.org website, there is a, a, a list of all kinds of events that are held in various places. I think there's a map that you can look where you are and see what event might be near you. Uh, Virginia Pierce, again, any great links to include about the eclipse? Uh, well, there, um, again, I would start with my website at eclipses.info, and I would go to eclipse.aas.org or eclipse2017. Uh, dot, uh, um, NASA gov and then and then there are a bunch of other good uh, good websites too that you could uh, think through. Would you recommend viewing from a mountaintop? Uh, if if you get a clear view to the uh, northwest or the southeast from the mountaintop and you're in totality, uh, then you might be able to see the shadow coming a couple of, of uh, minutes in advance. You see the sky darkening in some direction, and then you're enveloped by the shadow. Uh, turn the other way, see it going away. So that can be fun. I don't make that my first priority, but if you're just watching the eclipse, that's a nice thing uh, to do. Uh, and I was late to the webinar, might have been answered, but how will the eclipse look if the person is not in the specific directory of the total solar eclipse? And my answer is you might not even notice it. If you have a filter and you look up, you can see the moon uh, covering the sun or apparently apparent bite out of the sun as though a dragon is eating the sun. But in, unless you're in the last couple of percent, uh, if you're in a 70% eclipse or a 60% eclipse, you wouldn't even notice it unless you, uh, you looked up. There's, so there's just a big difference when you're in totality or out of totality. Um, the, uh, whether this is on YouTube, it's gonna be archived in active, on Access Science and I'll leave the Access Science people to talk about that. So I don't think it's on, on, uh, on YouTube how to get a library guide. Uh, well, just the website is eclipses.info, and that links to some sources that have uh, guides and some written material. I've actually just written a summary of access with uh, all kinds of new books. There are some great new books out about, uh, about eclipses, and we're, we will link uh, that. I have a review going to the journal Nature of four of the, of the books by David Barron, B-A-R-O-N, and Anthony Avini, A-V-E-N-I, uh, for example, or, or David Dvorak, D-V-O-R-A-K, or Fred Espinak, E-S-P-E-N-A-K, uh, uh, with a, uh, with a co-author, and uh, Frank Plos, C-L-O-S-E. So these are all, uh, and uh, Tyler Nordgren, N-O-R-D-G-R-E-N, uh, and they, these are good books that you could really enjoy uh, 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 reading, and uh, and so we've arranged for libraries to distribute glasses. There have been programs of uh, donations of glasses to libraries to give out, and we hope the libraries will have these books available too. 
Uh, Andy Epperson writes, we should recommend our participants in watching the event use protective film for their cameras, mostly starts ones I can imagine. Is that correct in the 90% region? If you're in the 90% region, Annie, go to the 100% region. Don't sit home. Get in your car and go. And you might have to leave very early in the morning to get away from the traffic plan. So if, if you're in 70%, you should start three days in advance and go. But if you're really in the 90%, you really should be in the 100%. It's, it's very, very different. Um, so uh, you could try uh, putting some filter over the, the little lens of your, of your smartphone. Uh, you do, in the partial phases, you do want that. Uh, in totality, for a few minutes before and after, people just prop their phones up with no filter. But uh, you really want to be in the zone of, of totality. You won't see much with a smartphone um, in, uh, because the image will be pretty small, uh, but you do need the filter if you're going to prop it up. So how can I see it again? Well, in 2019, there'll be a total eclipse in Chile. In 2020, there'll be a total eclipse uh, in Chile. And there are many people who, once they see an eclipse, it's so wonderful, they uh, go travel all around the world to see these eclipses. And I run into the sim a whole group of people in various countries around the world now and again. Uh, do you need the protective glasses before totality? How long from start to finish? Well, you can start today. Uh, you can look through the, uh, through the glasses at the sun even today, and you need them from any time you look at the sun until totality. So at the diamond ring, uh, you can take off the glasses, and then when it starts getting bright on the other end, you put the glasses uh, uh, back on. And the, uh, so for the eclipse itself, you're in the center line of the eclipse. It'll be between 2 and 2 and minutes and 40 seconds in the U.S., but some people prefer to be near the edge. You get a shorter totality, but you get more, more Bailey's beads on the edge, more of the red prominence or the prominence of chromosphere on the edge. So some people prefer to go to the edge instead of the center, though I prefer to get the maximum totality in the center. How to do the webinar again. Um, the, uh, that is the Access Science people, sign up to Access Science, uh, info on, on books. I have a uh, well, my books, including a book on the sun that's just coming out in two weeks, is listed on my website at uh, solacorona.com or my name, pasticop.com, uh, and I will be posting links to, to the reviews of these, uh, uh, of these other books, um, but uh, I haven't posted that yet. First day of class is Annie Epperson. Good, good luck in, with your Eclipse Festival. And the last question, do the eclipses.info URL include information about free solar eclipse glasses? I don't have anything about that on that website. There's more about the eclipse glasses and the events than libraries that will have the free glasses at the American Astronomical website at eclipse.aas.org, where AAS is the American Astronomical Society. Uh, and this Lee, thank you. And, and here's Hi. information. Mark Dirks about how to, how she's post, how he and they access science is posting the recording. Yep, we're gonna um, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna you know kind of pull together some of this information as well and hope to follow up with everyone on uh, the on the presentation today, and then we'll be able to um, you'll also be able to access the video as uh, Mark put there in the chat. So. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and Great. thanks again, Dr. Paskoff. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Paskoff, and thank you to You're everybody. welcome. It was fun. I, I hope everybody gets to see the eclipse, and by that I mean the total eclipse. Yes. Great. Great. And I'll just quickly remind folks that um, we will be sending out um, a reminder um, about the recording for today's program. So be on uh, the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice. That'll have a link, a direct link to the recording of this webinar. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope you have uh, a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.